Hi, I'm Matt Sprague, host of the Connected Construction Show, and I have a special announcement for our audience. This November 7th through the 9th, Trimble is hosting their Dimensions User Conference at the Venetian in Las Vegas, and they've just given us two tickets valued at over $1,700 each to give away to our audience. So how can you win? Simply share your favorite episode on any social media platform using the hashtag ccshow underscore favorite and include why that's your favorite episode and you'll be eligible to win. The shared post with the most amount of likes will win two free tickets to Dimension 2022. Five runners up will receive a special Connected Construction Show t-shirt and sticker. So get out there and share your favorite episode before October 21st. We will announce the winner live on the show Tuesday, October 25th. Again, share your favorite episode on any social media platform using the hashtag ccshow underscore favorite and include why that's your favorite episode before October 21st in order to have a chance to win the two tickets to Dimensions in Las Vegas. Good luck and stay connected. From Trimble Construction, you're listening to The Connected Construction Show, where we connect you to the contractors, owners, designers, engineers, and construction professionals who are finding better ways to work. And now, Here's your host, Matt Sprague. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Connected Construction Show. I am your host, Matt Sprague. Happy to have you here and happy to have... Uh, so we have two people on the show today. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome my co-host, Sumele Adilano. Uh, Sumele, uh, introduce yourself a little bit and tell tell the uh, the viewers and listeners who you are and what you do. Hi everybody, Sumaria Adelano here. I'm the Senior Strategic Marketing Lead at Trimble. Um, I look after marketing, I grab the voice of customer, I want to know what's happening in our industry. My background is in architecture, so I've always got a passion for what we're doing and how we're looking into the future, how we're transforming the world uh, with Trimble products. So excited to be here with you, Matt. Um, let's go. Let's go. So. Sumele and I are uh, equally excited to have our guest. So our guest is Carl Sterner, who is the Director of Design and Sustainability for Soul Design and Consulting. Uh, Carl, welcome. Thank you for having me. So tell us, um, tell us a little bit about your background, um, you know, how you got to where you are today, uh, your journey and your career, uh, and what you do at uh, Soul Design and Consulting. Sure. Well, let me start with that last piece because it's the most straightforward. Um, so Soul Design and Consulting is um, a little bit of a unique organization. It specializes in green building design and consulting, as the name suggests. Um, so that includes a lot of certification work. So lead certification, passive house, other ones that you may have heard of um, across a whole range of building types from large scale commercial down to single family. Um, my role there though is a little bit different i actually lead the architectural design studio so we actually will take on full service architectural projects that have high sustainability ambitions um, so if you're looking for a design that is net zero energy or uh, carbon negative or passive house or something like that then we feel like we have a uh, unique ability to integrate sustainability and design uh, having both together in the same team um, and really, this is kind of the perfect place for me because my entire career has been focused on sustainability in the built environment. In fact, I went into architecture knowing that that was what I wanted to focus on. Um, and I will probably, we may touch on this a, a little bit later, but I um, you know, ended up working at architecture firms that, that you know, focused very much on sustainability and seeing a need for better tools. And so I actually took a bit of a detour uh, off of the architectural track for a few years and worked actually with Sapphira, um, helped to create uh, that product, which is an energy modeling and daylight analysis software for architects. Um, so essentially helping to create the tools to enable architects like me 
to design greener and more efficient buildings. And that's where I met Carl. Interesting, yes. not yet we used to work together. Um, yes. and, I've you know, always, and I used to be colleagues. Yeah, and I've always appreciated Carl's like really keen mind and focus on sustainability. So I'm really excited for this conversation. He's got nuggets to drop. I'm sure. I'm absolutely positive, uh, especially with all, with all the conversations we had leading up to this day. So, um, Sumile, I, I'll hand it over to you to, to, to kick off the, the, the first question after the get to know absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh, so I know that, Carl, you've devoted a good chunk of your career to um, addressing sustainability through the work that architects do. How do you think that buildings can start to become part of the solution to climate change? Uh, and how do you think the architect's role is changing when it comes to making construction greener? Yeah, um, that's a great question. We live in a really interesting time, I think. Um, a lot is going to be decided in the next few decades in terms of, frankly, the course of our civilization. <laughs> and architects have a big role to play in that. Um, just as a kind of stage setting here, um, buildings are responsible for about 40% of global carbon emissions. Um, about 30% of that is operational. So it's what they consume for heating, cooling, you know, using electricity. And then 10% is the materials that are actually used to build the building. So a lot of that is like concrete construction, steel manufacturing. In, fa in fact, concrete itself is about 8% of global emissions. So larger than most countries, if you just took all the concrete together. Um, and so architects have a really big role in potentially addressing that giant piece of the pie. Um, and I think, you know, you guessed how architects' role is changing. I think that architects are realizing uh, how much of an impact they can have and um, starting to look at both pieces of that, both the material side and the building operation side. Um, so when I think about how a building is addressing climate change, I kind of have three major categories of things. One is radical efficiency. Um, we can design buildings today that use 60 to 80% less energy than a conventional new building. Um, and that's, I mean, that's practices that we have in place. We're doing that now. Um, the second piece is uh, grid integration. And this is kind of uh, an emerging area that we're just starting to get into. This is the, basically the idea of how does the building participate in the larger electric grid? Um, and we can get into that, but I think buildings actually have a role uh, in helping to, to promote more, a uh, kind of more renewable, more resilient grid. And then the and third so piece. Um, delivering, delivering energy back to the grid as opposed to only taking it, right? That's what you mean by Yeah, so that, that that's one piece of it. Yeah. Um, there's, there's actually a second piece, which is how do you manage the load? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the issues with a renewable grid is that the energy isn't necessarily produced when it's needed. So if you think about when the sun is shining most, it's midday, uh, but when it's needed actually tends to be later in the evening. Everyone gets home, we're cooking, we're turning on appliances, energy use goes up in the summer, cooling goes up later in the, in the afternoon. Um, but a lot of those are loads that buildings we actually can control. Um, so either through passive design, we can design our buildings so that um, you, either through thermal mass or other means, we're shifting some of those loads by a few hours here or there. And by shifting that peak, we can actually align when we need the energy better with when it's produced. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also some interesting technologies in, around demand response. So certain things that we're doing in our buildings that maybe we have some flexibility as to when they happen. Um, water heating is one example. Um, as we get more car charging, that may be another example um, where we can start to build some flexibility into the usage. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore need less storage on the grid, need less kind of backup peaker power plants to kick on late in the day, um, and overall lead toward that renewable energy grid. And sorry, I know I've been going on a long time, but I think the third key piece that sort of uh, architects are starting to focus on more is actually the materiality of architecture. So we talked about how like concrete and steel are, are big sources of carbon emissions. 
So choosing what materials we build out of um, and trying to use materials potentially even that can sequester carbon rather than being sources of carbon. Um, and that's something we could also dig into further if you're interested. But there's there's a lot here. And it's uh, if you can't tell, I'm super passionate about it. I could probably geek out all day. <laughs> Great responses and lots for us to dig back so, into. Put over to Mark. Yeah, so I'm going to dig. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to dig. Um, so, so Carl, uh, so I, this is amazing. And you're speaking from, uh, the perspective of the, of the architect. Um, if we could shift it to the perspective of the owner, um, what are the, I, I feel there are some obvious reasons why the owner wants this, but maybe there are, maybe there are some not so obvious reasons. So, or, or is there a blocker? Is there, is there something holding back owners to require this type of architect, uh, this, this type of design? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. And I think it, the answer varies a little bit by sector because of course, different building types have different ownership structures. Um, that's one of the reasons why you see kind of institutional players like universities who know they're going to own their buildings for a long time. Um, be, you know, they historically have been very interested in sustainability because they're going to see that payback directly. Um, whereas sometimes residential areas where, you know, maybe the renters pay utility bills and it's, you know, there's split, split incentives across different players. The structure of that one maybe doesn't lend itself quite as much. Um, but we are seeing, um, I guess maybe just to back up and, and try to answer your question directly, there's probably a few different categories of benefits to owners. The most obvious one that, that folks have talked about for a long time are energy and utility savings. Um, and I think that's, that's absolutely true. And, you know, if energy prices continue to go up or we have a price on carbon, obviously that will get the case for that will get even, you know, even better. But in addition to that, I think uh, indoor environmental quality is a big piece, um, a big reason for owners to pursue sustainability and healthy materials. And we've seen a lot of interest, especially in the past couple of years since COVID um, on indoor air quality. Um, and it turns out there's a, there's a lot of good synergies between the sorts of things you would do to improve the efficiency of a building and the things that you do to improve the indoor air quality. Uh, so just as one example, um, we're seeing a lot more uh, interest in passive house design. This is a very energy efficient building program. Um, originally came from Germany in the kind of 80s and 90s, and it's, it's, it's kind of moved uh, over the sea to the U.S. here. And we're seeing it picked up really in force, especially in affordable housing developments. And even though passive house's focus, primary focus, is on the energy piece, and you can really get those kind of 60 80% savings I was talking about through this system. Um, they also um, tend to incorporate active ventilation systems in those projects. And it's because they're achieving a very high level of air tightness, a very airtight envelope. And then they're putting active systems in to bring in fresh air and filter it and deliver it where it's needed. And it turns out that that fresh air, that active fresh air system, delivers much higher air quality to the occupants. And of course that, you know, there've been lots of studies that correlate, you know, indoor air quality with higher productivity levels, um, you know, higher satisfaction rates, higher well-being, lower, you know, sick days in office settings. There's, there's a lot of reasons to focus on the um, indoor environmental quality that have to do with just humans, people, us, you know, if you get, if we're happier and we're doing better work, like that's better for, for everyone. Um, and I think that's a major driver of um, interest from owners in some of these practices. That, thanks for uh, indulging my dig. So um, we also, we love the, the net zero energy home that, uh, that, that you designed in Iowa. Uh, when do we think we'll start to start uh, seeing these type of approaches use, used in larger scale uh, in bigger commercial buildings. Yeah, um, fortunately, they they already are. I think we are seeing them used at the larger scale. There's a lot of great work being done. I think some of the um, we're increasingly seeing that some of the 
award-winning projects like that, uh, say, the American Institute of Architects is celebrating are also very high-performance buildings. Um, so it's also showing that, you know, good design can also be sustainable design. That you don't have to be in conflict. And some of those passive house projects that I mentioned, um, we're starting to see there are certain states like Pennsylvania and Massachusetts that have incentivized that approach. And in those states, we're starting to see the cost premium of that type of construction come down in some cases to zero, meaning that it's literally not any more expensive to build a multifamily passive house today in Pennsylvania than it is to build a conventional. Um, and so I think the biggest barrier is really just inertia at this point, um, because achieving that level of performance, it's very technically possible. It's just, it requires a change in the way architects are designing the building. Oftentimes it, it requires a different way of constructing the building, especially when you're talking about very high air tightness requirements. That's just a kind of a mind shift for contractors. And so there's a learning curve and it just, take some time, I think, for the industry to, uh, you know, adopt these new practices and roll them out. And so I think the question really at this point is, how do we scale those up and how do we do it quickly enough that we can, you know, meet our global uh, carbon and climate goals? I feel if we, if we pivot a little bit to the technology side of what makes this kind of work possible, uh, Sapphire's 10-year anniversary was on July 17th. Can you believe that? 10 years of Sapphire. Um, and I know that it was disruptive when it landed in, in the industry, and I think it still is because, you know, the focus on early stage uh, analysis is still pretty unique uh, in terms of the depth of uh, insights that it can provide. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with Sapphire and how you hope that it could evolve in the future? And sure. maybe just give us a short like introduction to what Sapphire is and how you maybe use it today as well. Yeah, absolutely. So this is this is a great story. I'm glad you asked about this. Um, so Sapphire, for those who don't know, is a um, early stage energy and daylight analysis software geared toward architects and building designers. And the problem it's trying to solve is essentially uh, in those early stages of design. Architects are making a lot of really significant decisions. What's the shape of the building? How does it sit on the site? Where are the windows? These sorts of things have a huge impact on the energy use. But oftentimes, historically, they've been made without any real insight into the impact that those decisions are having on performance. So Sapphira was a tool that was designed to uh, give that feedback very quickly to architects as a tool that's kind of lightweight enough and easy enough to use that you can integrate it into that very fast, iterative, early design process. Um, my involvement with Sapphire, this is really, it's a kind of a fun story. So I was working at an architecture firm, a very good firm, William McDonough and Partners, that focused on sustainability, um, kind of in the you know, early 2010s. And I, as a designer, just was struggling with the tools that were available. Um, because we, you know, we would often have teams of very good consultants on those projects. Uh, but by the time the consultants could get us feedback, like decisions, it just, the, the cycle time was too long. You couldn't consult with them on every decision. Um, we tried to use a number of tools in house, but those also took a long time. They were not geared toward early design. They were geared to late analysis. And so I kind of made a crazy decision, um, in like 2010, 2011 to, um, in the middle of a recession, no less, to quit right. a great job at a great firm and be like, I'm gonna pivot to software. Um, and I, I I came across Sapphira, which at that point was, was still in its early stages. We actually had not released uh, the product yet. Um, and I joined on as the first product manager of that product. And I got to kind of develop the tool um, kind of create the thing that I thought the market needed, the thing that I as an architect wanted to use um, and got to oversee the, the launch of it and really see phenomenal growth. I mean, over the course of, I think, the, the, the five years um, I was there, we became a global company, you know, users all over the world. Um, 
and, and surveys from from or, architectural organizations were showing that it was the most used analysis tool among, archi among architects, which I think is great because a it showed there was clearly a need, and b the more folks who are doing this type of analysis, the better buildings you're going to get. And at the end of right. the day, that's the thing that drives me, right? Is that we need to change the way buildings are designed. And this was a way that, that I saw to really have uh, a, a big impact on the industry. So um, really pleased with it. I think um, in terms of the future, I mean, broadly speaking, my ideal tool would be something that I could actually use in the early stage and then continue to use throughout the design process. So I think um, the next frontier is like, you know, the, the, the software tool tools that we use are still somewhat fragmented and it would be great to have one that you can just continue to build on. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's my ask for the Sapphire team is. Uh, Noted. I will take it back yeah. to the product team. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess as a follow-up to that, the tools will continue to evolve. Um, but what gives you hope that the construction industry will conquer the challenge of reducing emissions specifically and then creating net zero structures? Yeah. Um, I'm listening. A couple things give me hope here. One is... Um, just the scale we're, we're starting to see the uptake of these practices begin to scale up um, and we're starting to see them in uh, sectors that were maybe difficult to uh, imagine them being in you know a decade ago so on one hand like lab buildings were notoriously hard because they had you know incredible amounts of internal loads and equipment and high ventilation rates and you're starting to see firms that are starting to tackle like lab and healthcare buildings and still being able to do some really ambitious things with them and on the other hand you're seeing you know in affordable housing and low-income housing a lot of work being done on kind of passive house projects and proving that that high performance can actually still be done cost effectively um, mm -hmm. for projects that you know maybe in some ways are opposite of the lab building because the lab building is going to have a, a budget that can maybe support those things. Whereas affordable mm -hmm. housing is, you know, has to um, meet very strict requirements. So that's one thing. I think the second thing that I'm really interested in where there's a lot of movement right now uh, is actually in the materials space. So I had mentioned that, you know, uh, the, the things that we build out of are responsible for a lot of carbon emissions. And you're seeing, uh, I think, kind of two things in the material space. One is a lot more bio-based products. So if you have things that are, you know, made out of bamboo, hemp, you know, straw, wood, all of these things are, you know, plant-based products. So as those plants are growing, they're sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and they're literally storing it in that material. Um, now, a lot of that comes with some provisos because whether or not the material is truly carbon negative depends on the uh, farming practices that were used. And in the case of wood, it depends heavily on the forestry management practices. Mm -hmm. So obviously we can't clear cut forests and claim it's sustainable. Um, you need to be, you know, managing forests sustainably. But if that is done, then wood can be a... Um, you know, net carbon sink. Um, and then the other kind of category of material innovations are things like uh, low carbon concretes. Um, you're seeing a lot of startups that are kind of looking at bio-based concretes or, or, or even uh, kind of mushroom composite concretes, things that are actually absorbing carbon in different ways in their concrete curing process. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of those technologies are still very, you know, in very early stages. But I think that if we can commercialize that sort of technology and roll it out quickly, that could be a game changer because it could take what is currently, you know, 8% source of carbon emissions and flip that into a sink. Um, that, that could be really exciting. Yeah, I know that when I was in architecture school, we all used to, uh, to kind of take the sustainability box and would say, yeah, it's fly ash concrete and uh i think more more opportunity there will definitely um, 
make it easier for the industry to be able to specify things that would actually suck um, carbon out of, out of the process. So amazing, exciting stuff. It's like I said, it's a fun time to be in this industry. Things are changing quickly. So, uh, Sumele, we're actually at the time for the final question. But before I do that, do you have a- anything else that has come up in your in your brain that think, you want to ask Carl while we got the next question? Covered a good amount of stuff. You go for the next question. All right. Just didn't want to <laughs> didn't want to end it and leave you hanging. So, Carl. So this is our last question. Is a question that we ask uh, every single one of our guests, um, and it's not necessarily construction related. It's more of uh, you know, kind of your own experiences. So what is your motto or what is a motto that you've kind of lived by or that you've, that you've heard that you find extremely uh, yeah. interesting and um, useful for your day to day? I have to say this is a motto that I think this originally came from Joseph Campbell, but it came to me through one of my first bosses, William McDonough, who was an architect known for sustainable design. And he used to say, uh, follow your bliss. And that's something that I have tried to do throughout my career. Um, You know, following the things that I'm passionate about and that really kind of motivate me to get up, get out of bed and, you know, tackle these challenges every day. And uh, I think it's, it's paid off, you know, it's, um, uh, it, it, if you can construct a career that is not just, you know, not, not just paying the bills, but is rewarding and, and, um, you know, is, uh, giving you bliss every day, then that's, I think one of the best things you can do. Yeah. And the industry that we, that we all work in, there's, there's no, there's no shortage of us being able to see the impact on everything that we do, whether it's, design and architecture or whether it's helping develop and promote software, (laughs) but we can see, we can see the, uh, we can see the impact that it makes. So, um, and certainly the, 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 uh, you as a guest has made an impact on our show. So thank you so much, uh, for joining us. Sumele, thank you so much for, for helping me out today to bring a, bring a unique perspective to this conversation. Um, yeah. So, Everybody listening, everybody watching, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to the Connected Construction Show. Uh, Again, I'm Matt Sprague, your host. Until next time, stay connected. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Connected Construction Show. For more information, visit us at connectedconstructionshow.com.